Uh, good morning and welcome. My name is Elise Grande, and I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace, which was established by the US Congress in 1984 as a public nonpartisan institution dedicated to helping prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict abroad. We are very pleased to welcome everyone to our discussion today on justice, accountability, peace building, and democracy, and to be co-hosting today's discussion with the US Department of State in support of the 2023 Summit on Democracy. We're fortunate to have a distinguished panel joining us online, including Alexandra Matvichuk, the head of Ukraine's Center for Civil Liberties, which as we all know, has received this year's Nobel Laureate. We also have Gina Kabarkas Marcia, the director of the Justice and Criminal Policy Laboratory in Colombia. Also joining us is Baba Galu Jallo, who is the first Roger Fisher Fellow in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution at Harvard Law School, and a former commissioner on the Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Commission. It's a pleasure to welcome Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Colleen Krenwelgi from the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice, Beth von Skak, and Fabrizio Guragrilia, the Director of the Hague Branch Office of the International Development Law Organization. With authoritarianism growing and the global rules-based order under all kinds of pressure, ensuring accountability and protecting democracy have become some of the most pressing and important priorities facing the international community. These are issues that are central to global stability, to our shared prosperity, to freedom, and very importantly, to peace. Countless governments and organizations across the world are rising to this challenge, developing and field testing both formal and transitional mechanisms and strategies for reducing impunity and delivering justice to civilians who have been impacted by war and conflict. As a leader of global democracy, the US has a special responsibility to take decisive steps to advance accountability and deliver justice, including things that we have been reluctant to do in the past. We need to do this so that we can demonstrate to everyone that we are serious about democracy. The announcement yesterday made by Ambassador Van Skok that the US government supports the establishment of a special tribunal to investigate and prosecute the crime of aggression against Ukraine by the Russian Federation is the kind of important bold step that is urgently needed. Our panel today will be discussing these themes and the tasks in front of us from the perspectives of Colombia, the Gambia, and Ukraine. To present welcome remarks, we're delighted to have Colleen Quinwelgi, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of State's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Ms. Quinwelgi is a career Foreign Service Officer who has served in Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Mongolia, Azerbaijan, Bolivia, Nigeria, and at the OSCE. Colleen, please. Thank you, Lise, and sincere thanks to you and your team for organizing and hosting today's important discussion. Its themes will be key topics throughout this week's Summit for Democracy. There is ample evidence that lack of justice and accountability can contribute to cycles of violence and undermine democratic institutions. The need for accountability for past wrongs has been demonstrated, unfortunately, time and time again. The US government has committed to ensuring accountability, including through the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act and the US strategy to anticipate, prevent, and respond to atrocities. The strategy itself underscores the need to prevent atrocities, especially for at-risk groups. This, of course, requires careful planning and coordinated action to ensure specific needs are addressed 
especially among marginalized communities. One way the United States fosters accountability is through the conflict observatory. This is, in my view, an innovative program supported by the Department of State whose partners use open source information to independently compile and document evidence to support investigations of abuses during Russia's war against Ukraine. Reports are publicly available and information is collected and preserved consistent with international standards for use in ongoing and future accountability efforts. The United States also supports accountability in countries around the world by strengthening democratic institutions, promoting the rule of law, and supporting transitional justice mechanisms. It's important, of course, that US government, justice, and accountability efforts reflect an understanding of the cultures and communities in which they are undertaken. Colombia, the Gambia, Ukraine, and other countries present unique needs and challenges requiring tailored approaches. It's also important for justice and accountability efforts to incorporate the perspectives of groups frequently excluded, like women, LGBTQIA individuals, and indigenous communities. Justice and accountability contribute to society's overall stability only when equally accessible to all. All citizens must have opportunities to safely participate in governance free of the risk of violence. We firmly believe that by recognizing the atrocities of the past, pursuing justice and accountability, removing impunity, and building strong institutions to promote and protect the rule of law, we can contribute to the overall health of democracy. Now with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Beth von Skak, Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice. She advises the Secretary of State and other Department of State leadership on the prevention of and response to atrocity crimes, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. She served as deputy to the ambassador at large from 2012 to 2013. Prior to that, she was the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor in Human Rights at Stanford Law School. Dr. Van Skak began her academic career at Santa Clara University School of Law, where she taught and wrote on international human rights issues and also served as the academic advisor to the U.S. delegation to the International Criminal Court Review Conference in Kampala, Uganda. Earlier in her career, she was a practicing attorney, and she holds degrees from Stanford, Yale, and Leiden University. Ambassador. Thank you so much, Colleen, for that very kind introduction, and also for highlighting the role that the State Department plays in atrocities prevention and response as part of our toolkit for promoting democracy around the world. And thank you, of course, to USIP for convening us today. You're such a wonderful partner in justice. So as we convene now the second Summit for Democracy, countries around the world are facing mass violence and authoritarianism, forms of instability and fragility that beget repression, violence, and human rights violations that both threaten and undermine democracy. The field of transitional justice, which encompasses a whole range of measures that are judicial and non-judicial, that are formal and informal, that may be retributory or reconciliatory, provides a set of tools for war-torn and transitional societies to address legacies of mass violence, authoritarianism, and repression. In so doing, transitional justice can promote Accountability for gross and systemic violations of human rights can rebuild social cohesion, can help to rehabilitate victims and survivors, can restore trust in formerly abusive institutions, and can prevent the recurrence of such violations. Transitional justice thus provides a critical avenue to building a durable peace, an inclusive society, a thriving democracy, and greater prosperity for all. As we know, a comprehensive transitional justice program will encompass a range of measures that bring justice, broadly defined to include retributive but also restorative justice, but also includes elements aimed at truth-telling, reparation, memorialization and building historic memory, institutional reform, and putting in place guarantees of non-repetition. For a program to be effective, it must be inclusive, and it must reflect the preferences and expectations of the segments of the community that were most affected by violence, including women, racially and ethnically marginalized communities, and other minority groups. 
These processes today are being actively pursued in a number of different societies and post-authoritarian communities around the world. I'll just highlight a few here, and we'll hear from our esteemed speakers today about their own individual experience. In Colombia, a comprehensive peace accord ended a half century of internal conflict that had led to mass displacement, forced disappearance, and other atrocities, including sexual and gender violence. The peace accord finally gave voice to victims and survivors, including women and girls, in pursuing truth, justice, and reparations. I very much enjoyed meeting with the delegation from Colombia yesterday for the high-level dialogue, in which we were all able to learn more about the current steps at implementation of their very sophisticated transitional justice program. In Ethiopia, a cessation of hostilities agreement signed in November of last year ended two brutal years of civil war. The parties to this conflict have pledged in that cessation of hostilities agreement to implement a comprehensive transitional justice program with truth and accountability for these abuses, all within the context of the African Union transitional justice policy, policy framework. They're embarking now upon a seri series of public consultations with affected communities around the country. For such transitional justice to be true and meaningful, it must better incorporate the experiences and involvement of women. In the Gambia, the country and its citizens are facing the legacy of the Jame regimes, two decades of authoritarian rule. Their model Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Commission heard from more than 400 witnesses about the abuses under the Jame regime. The country now must ensure that those responsible are held accountable and victims are made whole. The United States has a small part to play in this effort. We are prosecuting one of the junglers, one of the death squad members of the Jame rule, who was found overstaying a visa in Colorado. He will be prosecuted under our torture convention, one of the first prosecutions to go forward after the Chucky Taylor case several years ago. And of course, Ukraine is actively pursuing prosecution in the midst of Russia's full-scale invasion, but will inevitably need to turn to other measures of transitional justice when the guns fall silent, particularly with respect to Russian-speaking areas in the East. Now, notwithstanding the proven benefits of a robust, inclusive, and genuine transitional justice program, calls to pursue these measures still face significant resistance from individuals and groups that are afraid to face their own responsibility for abuses, but also from deficits in political will. In addition, these efforts can be forestalled when persons who have been adversely named, for example, in a truth commission, or who have otherwise been involved in abuses, still remain in positions of power or authority. Sri Lanka, for example, has faced cycles of violence over many decades, including civil war, terrorism, insurrection, political repression, with UN investigations finding that war crimes and crimes against humanity have been committed. In 2015, a new post-conflict government accepted formally transitional justice commitments within the context of the Human Rights Council in the United Nations, including pledges to ensure remedies for survivors and their communities, to pursue genuine accountability for perpetrators, and to make other important institutional reforms. However, largely due to a lack of political will and an unwillingness to acknowledge that state actors also committed abuses, the government has largely failed to honor these commitments. The transitional justice mechanisms that have been stood up, such as the Office for Missing Persons and for Reparations, have not resolved cases, do not have the support of victims or their communities, or civil society, and appear to have been instrumentalized in order to entrench impunity rather than provide accountability. Sadly, the insecurity and instability that we're seeing in Sri Lanka is proof that transitional justice is not just a box ticking exercise. In Guatemala, we've seen independent judicial actors, anti-corruption advocates, civil society organizations, and members of the media who would seek to expose and bring justice for abuses during the long history of repression there have experienced persecution and harassment. We note with concern that many of these individuals and groups are being targeted precisely because they're trying to advance transitional justice within Guatemala, including with respect to some emblematic cases that have proceeded in Guatemalan courts. In particular, judges and prosecutors previously involved in the Commission, the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, CSIG, and also the ongoing historic military diary case are being intimidated, threatened, criminally charged, and forced into exile, all while trying to shed a light on abuses of the past. <clears throat> 
And in Liberia, following 14 years of two consecutive civil wars, characterized by widespread killings, torture, forced displacement, and the recruitment of child soldiers, that these abuses that devastated the country and its citizenry, has hosted a very important Truth and Reconciliation Commission cre that created space for victims and survivor to bear witness to what they experienced in these uh, two consecutive civil wars in an effort to achieve peace and reconciliation. However, the implementation of the very strong recommendations issued by that commission has been now stalled for more than a decade. No Liberians have been held accountable in the country themselves. The only justice that Liberians have experienced is in the courts of other countries where perpetrators have been found and where prosecutors have been willing to invoke universal jurisdiction and other forms of extraterritorial jurisdiction, even here in the United States. Many of those who were adversely named within the Truth Commission report still enjoy prominent positions within the government where they continue to block progress on accountability, they continue to entrench impunity, and they continue to block victims from further seeking justice. Now, the imperative to pursue transitional justice is clear, and we know that a range of different retributive approaches and restorative mechanisms exist. Indeed, USIP was instrumental in putting forth one of the first comprehensive volumes of transitional justice back in the 90s. Neil Kritz, I still have a copy of those three volume, that three-volume set. USIP recognized the important role that transitional justice would play in instantiating a durable peace. We also know that there are a whole range of tools, not just criminal trials, of course, but civil reparations, lustrations, or vetting that would, re would remove people from positions of power um, who were associated with a previous regime, rehabilitation and, re and reparation for survivors and victims, memorialization, and guarantees of non-repetition. Different forms of justice can address the continuum of needs expressed by survivors, their families, and their communities, including individual and collective reparations. Nonetheless, notwithstanding these archetypal models, each process within particular countries will be unique and context-specific. Such responses may be sequenced if some are more palatable to the prevailing political winds than others. And if there is resistance to a particular model being implemented or a particular mechanism being utilized, particularly if there are parties who may be implicated who still remain in power. Resistance to pursue criminal accountability, for example, may make the path to more restorative approaches more attainable, and that would later lay the groundwork for something more retributive. Victims and survivors continue to demand some measure of accountability, so criminal prosecutions cannot be forestalled forever. And we know that long-standing impunity is one of the significant risk factors for the recurrence of violence. This appears in all models of atrocities prevention and response. So that is the one thing we can guarantee, that there may not be deterrence if there is criminal accountability, but we know there will be no deterrence if there is no criminal accountability. Forgiveness and reconciliation are often seen as important aims of transitional justice processes. While these two interlocking phenomena are, of course, desirable outcomes of these processes, they cannot be forced upon communities. All a transitional justice program can do is to create space for reconciliation and forgiveness to happen organically. This attests to the critical importance of designing a whole program of transitional justice around the voices, experiences, and needs of victims and survivors. In the words of John Bra Braithwaite, who's a pioneer in the restorative justice movement, forgiveness is a gift that victims give. We destroy its power as a gift if we make it a duty. Finally, in designing a transitional justice program, it is vital to implement gender-sensitive approaches that allow for the meaningful inclusion of women and girls in all of their diversity. Without them, the legacies of violence will never be fundamentally addressed. The Women, Peace, and Security agenda has led to international recognition of the need to integrate women into all peace processes, including negotiations amongst warring parties. Their participation, and importantly, their leadership in these processes, can ensure that the needs, perspectives, and experiences of disadvantaged and marginalized communities, including rural communities, indigenous communities, and others, are fully integrated into peace processes, negotiations, and transitional justice mechanisms.
Colombia, in this regard, has been a model in terms of not only layering these different transitional justice mechanisms, but also for implementing an extensive gender-sensitive set of measures that have enabled the voices of women and girl victims to be heard and for the perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence to be held accountable. Yet even in the most inclusive situations, we have seen communities be excluded. They have not been provided the space or the opportunities to exercise leadership. This can structurally limit the ability of these processes to comprehensively understand and address the range of violations experienced by historically vi marginalized communities. Gender-sensitive approaches must include uh, a reaction to gender, sexual and gender-based violence, which is important in combating immunity, confronting gender inequalities and norms, and providing redress. Likewise, it is important that other marginalized communities are We've often seen that other marginalized communities are intentionally silenced, erased, or even ignored. Forms of violence that are perpetrated against individuals due to their sexual orientation or gender identity are often overlooked, including crimes we've seen people being lashed to death, burnt alive, brutally, hum brutally humiliated, and tortured, among other inhumane acts. Despite widespread understanding that gender inequality results in the disproportionate impact of violence against women and girls, the same recognition does not translate into looking at violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and intersex um, persons in existing transitional justice processes. Even though these forms of violence have been used by armed actors to simultaneously ingratiate themselves in society and also instill fear in communities. Sexual and gender-based violence against men and boys, especially in detention settings, is also repeatedly ignored, largely due to entrenched stigmatization. Atrocities are strategically and tactically committed on the basis of severe marginalization and prejudice and is structured in a way to entrench gender norms. It is time that the recognition of the linkages between violence and stigma is extended to all persons, including LGBTQI plus individuals across the globe. For example, we've seen in Afghanistan, where the Taliban has increased persecution of women, but also of LGBTQ plus persons through public flogging, gang rape and detention, and forced marriage. As we know, transitional justice is often initiated in the final phases of a conflict or after a political transition, when the guns have been silenced. There still is some work, however, that can be done pre-transition, and we've seen this in the situation in Syria, where governments around the world have invested in transitional justice processes, even while the conflict remains underway. This can send a clear message to perpetrators, regardless of affiliation, that they will be held to account. It can aim to defer, deter future abuses and socialize the value of a holistic and inclusive transitional justice process. So I very much look forward to hearing from the representatives of Colombia, the Gambia, and Ukraine who are here today with the expert moderation of David Sheffer as they speak to the justice and accountability processes currently underway in these countries. Each of these paths to justice is unique and context specific, but it's important that the international community in a spirit of partnership encourages transparent, inclusive, and genuine survivor-centered transitional justice processes in all of its form. Thank you very much, and I look forward to our discussion. Beth, Colleen, thank you for your introductory comments, and Beth, for laying out uh, what was so striking in listening to you was it, what's, what seems like remarkable progress across a number of conflicts in making central to peace processes and to national dialogues issues of accountability. It's a, it was, um, very heartening to hear that and to understand the work that's being done. Um, I'm very pleased now to introduce my co-moderator for this session, Ambassador David Sheffer. David is currently a professor of practice at Arizona State University. He is one of the U.S.'s leading experts on international law and international criminal justice. David served as the U.N. Secretary General's special expert on UN assistance to the Khmer Rouge trials. He led the U.S. delegation to the UN talks that established the International Criminal Court, and he has negotiated the establishment of five war crime tribunals. That includes the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, 
the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, and the ICC. David, we're delighted to have you here. It is our honor to welcome three very distinguished experts to discuss the indispensable role that justice mechanisms play in promoting democracy in countries that are emerging from conflict and from authoritarianism. Allow me to start by welcoming Gina Kabarkas Masia, who is the director of the Justice and Criminal Policy Laboratory in Bogota, Colombia. Gina has designed and implemented investigative methodologies for tracking extrajudicial disappearances as part of the unit for the search for persons reported as disappeared, which was created by the Peace Accords in Colombia. Gina, welcome. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Baba Gala Jallo, who is a journalist, a leading expert on transitional justice in the Gambia, where he served as the Executive Secretary of the Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Commission. And as I mentioned, he is the inaugural Fisher Fellow at Harvard Law School. Baba, welcome. And Alexandra, welcome back. Alexandra Matvichuk has been um, at USIP a number of occasions. Alexandra, every time we have you, we consider it a, a great honor. Alexandra is the head of the Center for Civil Liberties, as I mentioned in our introductory comments. That center won this year's Nobel Peace Prize. Alexandra has been at the forefront of efforts to document human rights violations and war crimes that were committed by Russia in its invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and is the author of numerous reports for the United Nations, for the Council of Europe, for the European Union, the OSCE, and the International Criminal Court. Alexandra, very nice to have you with us today. Gina, with your permission, we're going to start with you. And we would like you to share with us the way in which the lived experiences of indigenous communities in Colombia who were deeply impacted by your country's civil war. How have their concerns, their demands, been incorporated into both the legal and the transitional justice systems that the peace accords centered much of the discussion around? Gina, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you and good morning to everybody. Uh, I feel very honored uh, to be here and being able to share with you some insights regarding victims and survivors participation in a uh, transitional justice process in Colombia. Um, I've been involved, all my professional experience has revolved around justice processes in Colombia. Uh, I was also part of the historical memory group, uh, which was created in 2000 seven uh, as part of uh, a truth-telling process of the paramilitary uh, demobilization. Uh, I was also part of the prosecution office uh, in Colombia uh, in charge of various uh, investigations of grave human rights violations. And as you mentioned, I was part of the unit for the search of disappeared persons as well. Um, so um, what, I, you know, what I wanted to share with you was sort of um, the particularities of the Colombia case uh, regarding um, the participation of victims and survivors, and particularly of vulnerable and uh, historically excluded uh, communities uh, in the transitional justice uh, processes, and to share some of the uh, challenges uh, and tensions that have um, that that are part of the implementation of these uh, processes. Uh, so. Um, so just to give a, a bit of a, of a context, uh, Colombia's case is an example of a very long transition, right? So we've been in a transition at least since uh, 2006. Uh, and even though the 2016 peace accord marked uh, a final point for the armed conflict, we're still living uh, according to uh, the ICRC, uh, we're still living at least five regional armed conflicts, which means that violence keeps being part of the daily lives of a lot of communities uh, 
uh, in Colombia, particularly of indigenous and Afro-Colombian uh, communities. Um, justice mechanisms have been implemented to overcome a scarce justice to human rights violations, while, and I think this is an important part of the transitional justice process in Colombia, which is that while bringing justice to those human rights violations, there's also always an intent to try and solve the legal situation of former ex-combatants. So all the transitional justice processes have had that uh, two uh, intents in mind. Uh, in a sense, at least since 2005, trials have accompanied the questions regarding amnesties and a special treatment for former combatants that commit to peace. So efforts to strengthen democratic reforms during this transition period have been driven mostly, and this is specific for Colombia, I think, by a very present and organized civil society movement of human rights and victims organizations uh, that include indigenous and Afro-Colombian uh, communities that have mostly prioritized justice mechanisms to advocate for those demands. And the state response to these demands have been um, has been very important and although um, I, I would argue very complex and sometimes slow, uh, it has resulted in uh, various uh, different types of transitional justice measures. So just to get a sense of all the types of measures that we're talking about, we're talking about more judicial institutions for accountability. So at least one special jurisdiction for peace, uh, which was recently or created with the peace accords, but also uh, a special jurisdiction in the ordinary justice system to address paramilitary uh, violations. Uh, one complex and very big administrative reparation system for some victims of the armed conflict, a civil transitional justice jurisdiction for the restitution of land, and several memory and truth state-led initiatives, including the 2022 Truth Commission's report. So we have a wide variety of, uh, of, of measures of transitional justice that uh, have been implemented in over the past 15 years and in which the participation of victims, survivors, and indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities has been um, different, but it's, it's always been present. Mm. So one of the questions uh, of the summit was how has this uh, how, how all these uh, transitional justice uh, mechanisms uh, contributed to democracy and to a more, uh, a less violent uh, context, right? And just to get a sense, well, in, uh, in 2004, before the first, before that first transitional justice or sort of transitional justice uh, initiative was implemented, which is called the Justice and Peace Law, Colombia's uh, homicide rate was 45 over 100,000 uh, persons, which meant that at least 20,000 homicides were rep were reported a year. In 2022, uh, there were uh, 13,000 homicides, which meant that the rate uh, was reduced to 26. And all those these data uh, only accounts for a reduction on lethal violence. Uh, and one of the challenges, I think, of the transition is to report not only lethal violence, but other types of violence. Um, we can all agree that Colombia is less violent now than it was when uh, transition justice processes were first implemented. However, um, and trying to make sure to to portray the 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 situation of certain communities in Colombia, and particularly of indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities, in the last twenty four hours, uh, two social leaders in Tumaco, which is an Afro-Colombian and indigenous community. A municipality in the Pacific uh, coast of Colombia were killed. One was a woman uh, social leader, uh, Afro-Colombian, Mariela, and Linder, uh, which was a precisely an indigenous uh, juvenile uh, youth uh, leader. Uh, so we, we still have uh, very traumatic uh, murders and that are due to violence that relates to uh, the former armed conflict. Mm. Participation of victims and organizations can be assessed, I think, at least in two levels. 
Uh, one level is how human rights and victims organizations have been part of the design of transitional justice processes. Um, and not so much on the implementation, but on the design. So um, I would say that we've been from 2005 to 2022, there's been more participation of these organizations in the design of the processes. So just to give you an example, um, the three uh, main mechanisms of transitional uh, justice now implemented, the Jurisdiction for Peace, the Unit for the Search, and the Truth Commission had representatives of victim organizations, of indigenous communities, and of Afro-Colombian communities as judges, uh, commissioners, and um, a human rights, a long, uh, very renowned human rights uh, defender was the head of the Unit for the Search until uh, February. So. Uh, what we've seen is that in the design and the implementation of the processes, there has been uh, an increased participation of organizations, uh, especially of organizations and of victims. But another level, and maybe this is will, um, this is 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 an, an interesting uh, level, is how to assess the participation in the mechanisms uh, and in using those mechanisms. Uh, so to get a sense of that. Um, Colombia has nine over 9 million persons uh, recognized as victims of the armed conflict. This is 18% of Colombia's population. Uh, however, less than 6,000 uh, persons are accredited as victims in the jurisdiction for peace. So we do have, so even though victims report for administrative compensation, they are not necessarily present in the justice mechanisms. Uh, and with this, um, I'm, I'm going to finish with our, I'm going to mention at least six tensions or challenges I see on why uh, we see this variance between um, registered and uh, recognized victims and victims actually participating in the uh, transitional justice mechanisms. So uh, the first challenge I'm gonna mention is uh, how accountability processes are complex and although several legal mandates dictate there must be a victim-centered approach, and this is part of our, all our uh, legal instruments, these are processes that revolve around the alleged perpetrator and armed actors still. So for example, prioritization and selection strategies have been built mostly without the participation of victims and victims organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this, I think that the next few years are very important because the jurisdiction for peace is precisely uh, opening macro cases that part of their uh, intent is to actually incorporate victims and especially vulnerable and historically excluded communities. These new macro cases, which are uh, four in total, two ma four macro cases, are supposed to precisely account for that uh, what was mentioned in, in the um, intervention uh, before, which is how violence and, ex and stigma are part of the armed conflict and of those systematic violations of human rights. So I would say that that's one of the first challenges, which is to, uh, for these um, macro cases regarding accountability of the armed conflict to actually prioritize um, what those uh, violences that portray the stigma and uh, the violence suffered by, by those excluded communities. This is a huge challenge because precisely for, for what I said, which is that a accountability process is still focused mo mostly on the perpetrators and on closing um, the legal situation of those perpetrators and less on uh, what victims and organizations um, demand in terms of uh, justice. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge, um, I think it's that participation in accountability process is not enough to deal with trauma. And although um, there are some state services to attend trauma, these services are really very insufficient. And I think that this is maybe something that uh, other uh, countries can relate to, which is that uh, state services to address trauma are usually uh, underfunded uh, and uh, are very important. And usually what happens is that all the services uh, that victims need to address trauma have to be 
um, have to be um, have to be implemented by them, right? So it's an extra cost for victims. And that brings me to the third challenge, which is that participation is very costly. And it's and one can say that it's costly for the state, but I'm gonna argue that is most costly for the victims and the organizations. Hmm? So in Colombia right now, part of what we're uh, part of what we're um, doing is to implement the restorative approach to uh, reparations in both the jurisdiction for peace, but I'm, I'm sure uh, um, you are all aware that in the new um, peace process called the total peace, which is being um, designed by the new government, uh, the restorative justice uh, approach is also part of that uh, total peace model. And part of the, of the, of the, of the challenge is precisely to make sure that the restorative approach uh, comes back, restores the place of the victims in that approach. So now what, what has happened is that in the implementation of the restorative approach, um, measures have centered in the ex-combatants and how they contribute uh, to uh, those measures, but it's crucial to restore the initial intent, which is how to build a truly victim-centered approach that doesn't make uh, victims' participation more costly, but that actually uh, aids that those costs of the participation. The fourth uh, challenge, I only have six, so I have three more to go, uh, is how uh, participation in justice mechanisms has awakened political participation of victims and organizations. And um, this, I think, has been, is true both for um, victims and uh, indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. And there's still a huge challenge to build safe and possible strategies for political participation uh, of, uh, of victims and communities. Uh, I think this is part of what the new government is trying uh, to implement, which is to make sure that that awakening of uh, the political participation, which was precisely what the armed conflict uh, killed, uh, is one of the main issues in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in actually achieving a, a, a political transition. Hmm? The, the, four, the fifth uh, challenge um, is how rebuilding communities where victims and per perpetrators have to live together, uh, where some victims are related to some of those perpetrators, uh, how this is a very challenging um, a very challenging measure. And here, both Afro-Colombian and indigenous communities have a lot to teach us. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are implementing, uh, sometimes uh, without the state support, they are implementing ways in which you can rebuild communities where perpetrators and victims have uh, or come to live together again. But this is a huge challenge because victims and DDR programs, I, although are rightly divided, their implementation is coinciding in certain communities and this poses challenges for uh, making this rebuild of communities an actual uh, reality. And my final challenge um, is how non-recurrence is still far from being a guarantee in most communities that were most affected by the armed conflict. And this is something that we have to bear in mind always. So even though, and as I started my intervention, we can agree that Colombia is less violent now than it was uh, 15 years ago, in certain parts of Colombia, it's still a very violent place to live. Um, and it's a place as violent as in the armed conflict. Hmm? So current efforts for a total peace as the new, um, or my, I, I wouldn't say new, but the renewed, uh, government strategy to keep uh, the peace process alive, all those efforts for the total peace are definitely necessary. And um, and participation of victims and organizations in these new processes adds complexity to an already burdensome one, uh, but it's very necessary for a transition to be actually achieved. Uh, so with that, I would, I would end, which is the challenge of guaranteeing non-recurrence. Uh, in Colombia. Uh, thank you.
Uh, Gina, that was an extraordinary description of uh, a process which many people around the world regard as one of our generation's deepest, most successful national dialogues and peace processes. Um, Gina, what was particularly striking when we were listening to the way that you were linking the push for transitional justice and accountability, linking that directly to, I think you used the word, awakening politically of a group of people that had been historically excluded. Can you talk more about that? Because part of the reason that we wanted to host this event during the Summit for Democracy was to do exactly what you just described, to look at the link between the struggle for justice, the insistence and demand of citizens and victims for justice, and the link to democratic processes that over time can ensure stability and prosperity in countries. Gina? Yeah, so thank you. So, um, so I think that that uh, awakening has to do with the fact that Colombia's armed conflict, uh, even though it has um, organized crime elements, uh, it was a political uh, violent armed conflict. Uh, so there was, um, and I think in some uh, communities, there still is um, a fight for who, uh, who speaks for uh, politics and who is in uh, who is doing politics in those communities? And uh, this is what you know. This is what I think <clears throat> that the judicial, uh, the judicial demands of victims have awakened. And I and I think that here, uh, human rights and victims organizations have a lot to do with this, right? Which is that those demands for a uh, political um, uh, intervention have. For, for 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 decades they had to be addressed first uh, by uh, demanding accountability processes right and and here maybe one of the macro cases that we have to point out to is the macro case uh, number six which is a, ma a macro case that specifically focuses on uh, how the armed conflict extinguished uh, a political party in Colombia the Unión Patriotica hmm? uh, which uh, not odd enough, uh, is part of the now government's coalition, right? Um, so I think that that um, both in the accountability processes and in the new um, political agenda, what we're seeing is uh, how communities uh, and victims organizations are both still demanding uh, accountability for uh, that for those violations, and these are violations uh, that refer to political violence, hmm? and at the same time are trying to uh, democratically uh, earn a, a place in government, both in the national government and in a local uh, and regional governments. Uh, so, so yes, that the, I think that's what we're seeing uh, now in Colombia, which I think is very. A positive, which is because it's what shows that we are actually in a transition. It's a very long transition, a very complex, as I said, transition. Uh, but it's what shows that we are actually in a transition from an arm, armed conflict where political um, differences uh, were excluded violently to a more open uh, political uh, agenda and political race. Gina, thank you. Thank you, that was fascinating, Gina. I wanna turn now to Baba Gela Jallo um, and ask you how the work of the Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Commission has allowed state actors to better understand the transitional justice needs of civilians in the Gambia. And if you can give us a little background on that, uh, Baba, that would be very helpful. Have you unmuted, Baba? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, David, and thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share some of the experiences that uh, that we had in the Gambia. Um, as you probably know, um, the Gambia had two governments before the transitional justice process started. We had a government that was in power from 1965 to um, 1994, 
and that was supposedly a democratic government. But it was a democratic government where one party and one man won election after election after election. And so to the extent that at the end of the day, uh, people really got tired. Gambians got tired of having the same person in power for 30 years. So just as a side, um, aside here, um, I want to say that um, in considering the trajectory of democracy in the present, um, it is important for the international community, um, everyone um, concerned with peace and country prevention, to, uh, to, to, to take note that um, people do not want one individual in power for over three decades. Uh, it's simply not democratic, however you spin it, however people spin it. Uh, there are regular elections, they are supposed to be free and fair, but when individual wins elections over and over again and appoints a group of people um, in a musical, political musical chairs that eventually brought about a military coup and brought us uh, a person, uh, a military ruler, who beat his chest and, and boasted that he owned the country. And um, it is within that context of uh, 30 years of a one-man, one-party democracy and 22 years of a very brutal dictatorship that a transitional justice process was born in the Gambia. Now, um, in terms of how we are able to, to allow state actors to understand the transitional justice needs of civilians, um, I would say that we understood the transitional justice process, and in particular, the truth commission process as a conversation, as a national conversation, as a regional conversation, as an international conversation. Because at the national level is where we had the victims. Everyone in Gambia was a victim one way or the other. But then we had victims too from some West African countries, Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, etc. And we even had victims from the United States. So we conceived of the Truth Commission process as a conversation um, with many stakeholders who would be interested. And so that understanding, that determination shaped the type of operational strategy that we adopted, which was a double-pronged approach. Uh, we made sure that um, in addition to the public hearings, we also had um, a, a, a secretariat that was well-equipped with various units or departments, if you call them, we had a victim support unit that was able to engage a particular um, uh, demographic, the victim population in the country, not exclusively, but that catered to the needs of the victims. We had a women's affairs department or unit that went um, and catered for the needs of the women um, through outreach activities, through village dialogues, through town hall meetings, through women's listening circles to make sure that the concerns of all women, uh, not only the direct victims, um, are expressed within the work of the Truth Commission and are brought to the attention of um, all of the, the, the actors, the state actors, the non-state actors, everyone who was interested in the TJ process had a chance to know what the concerns of the women are. And um, one of the things that came out of some of our outreach activities was that women, we are all around victims. Uh, some of them, we are direct victims of witch hunting, direct victims of sexual and gender-based violence, direct victims of a fake HIV AIDS treatment program, etc. But every single person who was a victim in the Gambia has a woman who also was an indirect victim. So we made sure that we maximized the presence and the, the, the visibility of the women's involvement, women's victimhood in the TRRC process. We also had a Youth and Children's Network unit that as part of the secretariat that um, carried out outreach activities to schools and to youth communities across the country. Uh, what we are trying to do at that level was to make sure that all the Gambian people, every sector of the Gambian community was involved, was drawn into the conversation about what happened here in the past and how we could prevent a recurrence in the future. Uh, that was one of the, the, the trunks, the approaches that we took. The other approach was that we made the process completely transparent. We hired a media partner, a consultant, QTV, that had a digital um, uh, satellite uh, access that was that could be accessed from around the world. So you could sit in Washington, D.C., or in Moscow, or in Beijing, and watch. And all of the hearings that we had, 
all of the hearings, the public hearings we, are, we had were directly televised. We are covered live by TV, we are covered live by radio, and we are covered live on social media. And we also had interpreters um, who interpreted in the local languages. So what we are trying to do at that point was to make sure that since we conceived of the Truth Commission as a conversation involving different stakeholders, everyone, everyone who had an interest in the proceedings of the commission knew exactly what was going on. And in that way, then, we are able to bring um, uh, witnesses, victims, and perpetrators. We had, we had um, uh, about... Uh, 392, 393 witnesses, um, 229 of them were direct victims. There were 45 perpetrators, self-confessed perpetrators, people who came forward and said, we did this on the orders of the president. We also had institutional hearings on the judiciary where we had witnesses come who were um, former ministers, former directors of prosecution, and senior ministers, senior officers of the judiciary came forward senior officers of the National Intelligence Agency, and the secret police who were the, the major arm, uh, one of the major arms of um, the of repression came forward and testified. And we had junglers, members of the death squad also came forward and testified. So in this way then, we were able to make sure that everyone who was interested, both the state and non-state actors, as well as the Gambian population knew exactly what happened they heard it from the mouths of victims. Um, and we made sure that the process was so transparent that um, there, is no, uh, there is no space for denial, either by the perpetrators or by other interested parties or by the state itself. So um, that is how we were able to make, to allow the state actors to understand um, how uh, or what were the transitional needs uh, of civilians in, in the Gambia. Um, I, I'll stop there until you ask your second question, then we, we proceed with, with the conversation. Sure, Baba. Thank you very much. Um, two very quick uh, questions. One, the abuses that were documented during the TRRC process, how were those abuses and uh, documented abuses then used in the prosecution of JAMA? Uh, because that's oftentimes a very difficult equation for Truth and Reconciliation Commissions to deal with, uh, that interface with the justice system. And then secondly, how did the TRRC uh, help build momentum towards a more viable uh, and fair democracy uh, in the Gambia? Well, um, as far as the documentation is concerned, um, like I said, we had a transparent process. Um, all the hearings were documented live. Um, you know, we are shown live on TV and radio. So everyone knew exactly what was going on. But at the end of the day, the commission found that uh, Yaya Jami and his closest associates were guilty of crimes against humanity. That is in the final recommendations um, as defined in Article 7 of the Rome Statute. Um, Yaya Jami came out as an individual who was guilty uh, of crimes against humanity, which means that he could be prosecuted under universal jurisdiction. So even if the government of the Gambia um, is not willing, is unwilling or unable to prosecute him and other of his associates, the international community is going to do that. I think um, uh, that we know that um, one individual jungler, one of his death squad members, is now on pretrial in the US. Then there is another person um, on trial in Switzerland who was also a jungler, and there is another person who is on trial in Germany, who was a jungler. So uh, the, the evidence that came out, the recommendations that came out, make it possible for, for any individual, any interested party, including the ICC, to some extent, to be able to prosecute um, Jami. I think um, that Jami and his associates, I think that's the way that we are able to, to make sure that we documented, the, the, what we documented of the hearings um, will come to play when there is a need or an attempt to prosecute um, these individuals. Uh, in terms of the efforts to sustain momentum towards a transparent democratic system of government in the Gambia, that had a lot to do with the recommendations that we issued, that the commission issued, um, that included um, civic education, that included institutional reform, removal of the bad laws in the book, passage of um, anti-torture bills, 
In fact, um, just yesterday um, or the day before last week, um, an anti-torture bill was introduced in the Gambian parliament, and it seems as if it's going to, it's going to pass, uh, thanks to the recommendations of, of the TRRC. Uh, we also know that um, uh, there is a lot of uh, talk about developing democracy. What one of the recommendations of the commission says that there needs to be time limits in the constitution. That is absolutely important. Whoever wants to help Africa avoid uh, recurrent conflict, you know, must address the issue of time limits. Uh, people do not want to have the same government in power for 20 years, for 30 years. Uh, we have gone beyond um, that kind of, uh, you know, one-man democracy. If there is a definition of democracy, let it be made a universal definition. And you have certain criteria that must be taken into account if a democratic dispensation is described. But we cannot have a democracy where an individual government or one government remains in power for 30 years, one individual remains in power for 30 years, and so on and so forth. So all of these are part of the recommendations of the Truth Commission. The other result of the work of the commission that would help uh, sustain democracy and peace is the outreach activities that we conducted. Um, thanks to the outreach activities, uh, we popularized the notion of never again. Uh, we popularized uh, uh, you know, a lot of transitional justice work with the result that you have a lot of transitional justice mechanisms or institutions, CSO, civil society organizations that have cropped up during the process of the TRRC. And they are engaged as we speak today. They are engaged in outreach activities. They are engaged in advocacy for the implementation of the recommendations, also advocacy um, for uh, a public understanding of what is contained in the government white paper, which is kind of a response to the TRRC recommendations. So I think, um, you know, in general, I would say that we started or the TRRC started some kind of a movement um, that is premised on the fact that these bad things have happened and they should never happen again. And we are um, advocating for civic empowerment. Um, my uh, colleague from, from Colombia mentioned that, you know, a, a lot of people were marginalized in the political process. It's no different in the Gambia. In fact, they, we have people who are more marginalized here. And we think that if we must have sustainable peace and a workable democracy, then those people have to be brought in. They have to understand the rules of the game they are playing. They should not just be expected to go to the polls every five years and cast a vote and then sit back and have um, no uh, direct impact on the system that is running their lives. I think um, that is what I would say at this point. Bless you sound optimistic, is that true? Well, I am optimistic to some extent, uh, mainly because during the process of the commission, we made sure that the Gambian people knew what went wrong. We made sure that they were empowered enough to say never again. We launched a, a very, very strong campaign called the Never Again Campaign. Um, and we visited schools, we visited communities across the country. We, we had town hall meetings. We popularized it on the media. We made sure that Never Again um, is, is firmly entrenched in the national consciousness. And that is why today we have, we are happy to see that there are victims organizations, women's organizations, as well as civil society organizations that are working on other things, but also on transitional justice that are saying never again. And in terms of the implementation, we have seen some progress in terms of memorialization. For example, um, one of the arch, you know, a, a structure that was built by the dictator in the capital, Bangul, has now been renamed Victims Memorial Act. We, we, we have seen an introduction of civic education into the school curriculum, which was one of the recommendations of the TRRC. And uh, we have seen a movement towards the creation of a hybrid court. Um, you know, there have been conversations between the Gambia government and ECOWAS in creating this hybrid court to ensure that Jame and his, uh, his closest associates are, are, um, are, are prosecuted. There is still a lot of work to be done, but I think um, in addition to the fact that, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there is a torture bill that is currently on the verge of passing um, in the National Assembly. These are all signs that one could be optimistic about. But most importantly for me is the fact that the Gambian people are now empowered enough 
There is still enough work to be done, but they are now empowered enough to be able to say no to dictatorship, and no to abuses of power and human rights violations. And these individuals or communities are supported by a group of civil society organizations that are now operating within the society. And that would say no to any form of a move towards dictatorship by the current government and future governments. So yes, I'm optimistic to some extent. Baba, thank you very much. Liz? Well, um, Alexandra, can you describe for us the extraordinary role that Ukrainian civil society is playing in promoting accountability, even in the midst of the conflict and the war? When large-scale Russian innovation started, oh, we united our efforts with dozens of uh, regional organizations into one tribunal for Putin initiative. We have an ambitious goal to document each criminal episode which committed in the sm smallest village in each oblast in Ukraine. And working together only for one year of large-scale invasion, we jointly documented more than 34,000 episodes of war crimes. And 34,000, it's a huge amount, but still only a tip of iceberg. And I start to ask to myself, for whom do we document all these crimes for? Because we faced with a accountability gap problem. And this gap has two dimensions. There is no international body which can prosecute Putin and high political leadership and top military command of Russian state for the crime of aggression. Even International Criminal Court had no jurisdiction over this crime in situation Russian war against Ukraine. And that is why it's so important to create special tribunal on aggression and hold people who committed this crime accountable. And second dimension of accountability gap problem is in that fact that we faced unprecedented numbers of international crimes and national system is overloaded with it. International Criminal Court will limit its investigation only to several selected cases. Hence, the question is very clear. Who will provide justice for hundreds of thousands of victims of this war who will not be lucky to be selected by International Criminal Court? And this means that in order to fill this accountability gap, we have to involve international element into the level of national investigation and national justice to make national system capable to face with this challenge. And Ukrainian civil society not just document international crimes, which is committed on the territory of Ukraine, but also working on the vision how this complex justice strategy and new justice architecture have to look like. Alexandra, in addition to criminal accountability for the crimes that civil society is documenting, what are the additional, either formal or transitional justice mechanisms do you think are necessary so that justice is delivered at the scale that you're describing across Ukraine? When I speak about measures beyond cri criminal accountability, I will tell that we have to put persons affected by this war as a priority of all recovery process. When people hear about recovery because of the total destruction of country due to Russian aggression, people first uh, imagine the restorations of buildings, roads, schools, hospitals, bridges, and infrastructure. But we have, in addition to it, to implement some crime survivor support programs that would include compensatory mechanism for property loss cases, psychological and medical assistance, we have to support opportunities for inter internally displaced person and uh, people returning to the destroyed territories. We need to implement some development projects for the local communities and to support for Ukrainian business, which lost production facilities and assets due to the Russian aggression. We also should address natural environment restorations and protected issues. 
And in order to achieve this goal, international partners have closely cooperated not just with state authorities, but with civil society and local governmental bodies as well. Alexandra, do you expect that Russia will pay for the kind of reparations that you just described? I can't predict future, but we have to create all possibilities to make it happen. And we have to work on, the, on this vision of future, which we want to achieve. And I know from the history of humankind that authoritarian regimes collapsed. Their leaders who see themselves untouchable appeared under the court and the state who provided a pain for millions of civilians paid reparations. Well, Liz, shall we um, go to questions from the internet? Uh, Lauren? Do we have our, colleagues in the audience? Who or are colleagues there? in the audience, I'm sorry. Of course. Um, anyone in the audience who would like to um, ask a question? At this stage? Okay, if not, we'll start with the online questions. I can jump in. Uh, one of the questions we've received is, Guatemala, which was mentioned in the ambassador's remarks, shows that political will is critical to effective justice processes, to longer term justice. How have the panelists worked to maintain political will for justice and accountability processes? I could start with the Lees on that because I know Colombia has been at it for almost 20 years now. So how do you continue to build political will in uh, Colombia, Lees? Uh, Jean, sorry, Jean. Hi, um, yes, thank you. Um, so I think um, Colombia is a, is a good example because political will has, has not always been there. Um, and I think that part of uh, civil society and victims organizations um, achievement is to, despite uh, different levels of political will, to keep uh, being there and keep uh, promoting and demanding uh, justice. Um, so, so, so I think that 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 part of of my answer to that would be a strong uh, civil society and victims organizations uh, and how these uh, have remained uh, remained very strong despite uh, different levels uh, of political will. I would also mention that, um, you know, part of the discourse is to maintain uh, a very technical and human rights oriented discourse towards accountability and transitional justice. So trying to make sure that despite the political orientation of uh, the various governments, uh, this uh, discourse of human, uh, of, you know, of accountability for human rights violations has always been present. Um, and has uh, the, in, in the various types of, of government been uh, at the back of, of, of the demands. Um, but I would also have to say that um, international community play a very important role in maintaining uh, that political will and, uh, and accompanying civil society organizations and national uh, movements in you know, making sure that they don't feel alone uh, that we don't feel alone. Uh, so I think that international community in the Colombian example has played a very important role uh, in even when political will uh, levels are lower uh, to accompany organizations uh, in their efforts to uh, demand justice. Uh, so at least those three things I, I would mention. Um, I, the, the Guatemalan experience is very... Uh, it's, it's very like it's very troubling and for Colombia which which we've seen very closely uh, because in, in in Guatemala we have strong uh, civil society organizations a very strong uh, very important um, justices that have been for uh, human rights accountability but but you know um, the, the 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 new government and the corrupt government has uh, well, has changed 
uh, the situation, which is very, 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 you know, troubling for for uh, the we that have witnessed what has happened in, in Guatemala. But in Colombia, I would say that at least those three factors um, and making, you know, pointing out that civil society organizations have been very important in uh, in those in, 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 in making sure that those different levels of political will uh, don't affect uh, the demands for justice. Thank you, Gina. And uh, Alexandra, obviously in Ukraine, we've, we've witnessed enormous political will uh, throughout the war, but is there anything you'd like to add to, to the theme of the question, which is how you sustain this now for the long term? Uh, the problem which we face, I mean, how to achieve justice in the war with Russia couldn't be solved in national borders. So our um, goal is ambitious. We have to convince uh, not and to create this political will, not just on the level of state, but on the level of the world. And this is a point. And in order to do it, we have to work with two narratives. First, we have to explain international community that there will not be sustainable peace in our region without justice, where Russia for decades uses the war as the tool how to achieve their geopolitical interests and for decades uses the war crimes as the tool how to win this war. And all this hell, all this pain of millions of Ukrainians, which we now have for current moment, as a result of total impunity which Russia enjoyed for decades in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya, in other countries of the world. They have never been punished for this. And they start to believe they can do whatever they want. And we must break the circle of impunity. And second narrative, that it will be very difficult to provide democratization of Ukraine without justice. And justice is a part of preconditions of success of the stories. Because this war is not just a war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And Putin attempts to convince the whole world and Ukrainians that democracy rule of law and human rights are fake values because they couldn't protect you during the war. And in order to respond to this claim, we have not just quote the international conventions or declarations, we have to demonstrate justice. And without this, it will be very difficult to restore the belief of people that just rule of law is effective mechanism to solve problems. And when we speak about democratization, it's not enough to adopt qualities law or build sustainable uh, institutions. The non-formal values of society always stronger, values always prevails. And that is why we have to demonstrate justice in order to succeed in following process of democratization of the country. And very quickly, uh, Baba, anything to add uh, regarding the Gambia in terms of the political will in the years ahead to follow through? We're not hearing you, Baba, if you could unmute. Sorry. Sorry about that. Go. Um, yeah, I, I was saying that there has certainly been some concern over political will um, of the current government. Uh, especially prior to the 2021 elections, when the president, uh, the current president, actually uh, approved the party of the dictator who was ousted and the dictator himself in a bid to reconcile with him. Uh, fortunately for the country, that bid you know, fell, and they were not able to come to terms uh, with whatever conditions they had for a reconciliation between the current government and the government that was kicked out by the, the Gambian people. So there was a concern with that, and there was the concern uh, about political will when a faction of the dictator's party joined the current government and had some of the top officials of the past government uh, appointed to very, very, very uh, important positions, such as 
the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, who we are very, very strong supporters of, um, of the, the ousted dictator. So with that said, um, you know, I think that whether they have the political will to the extent that Gambians want it or not, the current government um, is left with little choice um, you know, for, for not going, going through with the implementation. There is a lot of local pressure. Um, uh, victims organizations, civil society organizations, and the general public are insisting on the implementation of the recommendations of the commission. And uh, there's also, you know, happily a lot of international pressure um, coming in from the United States, the, the, e, the, the EU, and, and other international partners uh, insisting that the, implement, the, the, the recommendations of TRC should be implemented. And I think we have seen, we are seeing some movement, however small, towards implementation, like the examples I mentioned uh, here. There is a, a draft bill um, uh, on torture um, in the National Assembly. There is a draft bill on reparations. There is a draft bill on the Peace and Reconciliation Commission that are all going through the legislative process. And hopefully, all of these bills will become law, and we'll see other aspects of the recommendations implemented. So there is, a, there is not totally 100% confidence that there is the requisite level of political will. But there is enough to keep uh, moving the process forward with a lot of pressure, both locally and internationally. Thank you, Baba. Um, question from the audience. Yes, right here. We just got the mic coming. Thank you. Uh, since, since Russia has not, I'm Sharon Kotak, retired from the State Department. But since Russia has not ratified the uh, ICC, is not a party to the ICC, and since it has veto power in the Security Council, is there a way of uh, having a criminal court that would, cr that would prosecute Russia for the crimes against humanity? Uh, Alexander, why don't I pitch that one to you? Did you hear the question? Yes. If you could uh, respond to that regarding the fact that Russia is not party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, how, uh, how will crimes against humanity be prosecuted against individual leaders uh, in Russia? This question demands to respond in two thesis. The first thesis is that International Criminal Court, because of um, declarations which Ukraine sent to the court in 2014 and 2015, got jurisdiction to investigate international crimes under his um, Rome Statute. And crimes against humanity is one of these crimes. So for current moment, International Criminal Court can investigate and prosecute any person, regardless of their citizenship, who committed crime in the territory of Ukraine. And in this regard, it doesn't matter that Russia don't ratify Rome Statute. But second part of your question, what we will do when Russia refused to cooperate with International Criminal Court, which we witnessed already, and started to provide threats to the court and to the officials of, uh, of the International Criminal Court, and in future will not recognize the verdict and uh, will not provide the transfer to the International Criminal Court, the suspected war criminals. And in this regard, it's really a problem that, um, that Russia is still the uh, UN uh, Security Council member uh, because it means um, it provides a huge political influence to Russia. And International Criminal Court has no international police or some other um, coherence measures how to push Russia uh, to be in line with uh, norms of international humanitarian and international criminal law. But um, it's a question of time, because even in this regard, uh, with our current situation, when Russia don't recognize uh, the activity international criminal courts to on investigation of crimes on the Ukrainian territory, including occupied by Russia, Crimea, and other part of uh, regions, uh, it's still 
very important. In the short term, we now in situation when Putin, a president of Russian state, became a wanted man. He officially suspected uh, as a war criminals. And all politicians who want to return to business as usual with Russia, despite this bloody war of aggression, will have to take into account this fact. In long term, we know that authoritarian regime collapsed and uh, countries who want to return to the normal connection and relation with other part of the world will would have to to play on the rule of the of the international order and international law and the bright example is Milosevic and Karadzic Serbia didn't want to transfer them to internet to hug but Serbia did Thank you very much. I think now we turn to Fabricio. Is this correct? Is he online? Okay. Uh, Fabricio, can you hear us? Yes, David, thanks. Hi. So, Fabricio, you? welcome. You're the director of the Hague branch office of the International Development Law Organization, and you have a distinguished prior career as a prosecutor with the International Criminal Court. And we are very uh, pleased and honored to have you uh, address a few closing remarks here uh, for this session. The, the, honor is, the honor is entirely mine. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for, for the opportunity of, to offer some closing remarks. It's a very difficult act to follow after hearing all these, these uh, experiences, first-hand experiences from, people, from justice seekers. Uh, in, in Gambia, Colombia, and Guatemala. And uh, I have written and rewritten my notes 20 times while listening to what they were saying. So everything that I'm going to say now may be a bit messy. Uh, but I think that a few important uh, conclusions or lessons may be drawn from the discussions that, that, that we have today. And first thing I think is that it's important to try to put some content on the broad label transitional justice, which is a label that can mean too many things, and at times has even been used as some sort of, you know, Trojan horse to try to basically indirectly introduce a layer of impunity in, in, in the conversation. And I think that uh, my, my good friend Ambassador Beth Van Schaak did a good job at the beginning of her presentation of trying to say, well, there are some components here. And um, criminal accountability has to be one of them. Uh, in, in, in that sense, I think that basically it is important that we do recognize that as I will say in a second, criminal justice is not in and of itself enough, but it is a necessary condition for any um, any uh, transitional justice process to be successful. And I think that here is interesting to see how, the, for instance, the Colombia peace process was one that arrived to what is a very interesting model, the special jurisdiction for peace, after really experimenting with a number of different options, including some that were bordering impunity, such as uh, blanket suspended sentences for everybody in exchange of admission of responsibility. So I think that's one, one point that I would like to make. Second point, I think it's important and critical to empower national justice seekers, and in particular national systems. So we heard that from Alexandra as to the challenges in, uh, that the Ukrainian national justice system is facing. And, you know, from my DLO, we know this firsthand because we are part of the uh, atrocity uh, advisory group, and we are... Uh, supporting the Office of the Prosecutor General in this uh, huge task of really trying to bring accountability at the national level for the crimes committed in the in the context of the current armed conflict. Um, so this is an important thing. Ensuring the ownership of the national actors in these processes is an important element. And that's what we're trying to do, I think, with the international support to the national efforts. We support and we advise but ultimately, it is a national process, what, what is happening. And I think that empowering also means protecting and hear the, uh, and, and giving the tools to do this properly and hear some of the concerns that were raised in terms of some national experiences where prosecutors and judges who were at the forefront of the fight against impunity later first persecution and had to ultimately leave the country, which has a chilling effect globally in terms of what can happen if you're a justice seeker and you dare you know speak the truth to power 
Um, the third thing is I think that I, it's important to put the criminal justice component within its true limits. On the one hand, we should not get carried away with the utilitarian effects that we ascribe to these processes. Yes, they can have a deterrent effect. Yes, they may help prevent other things. Yes, they do contribute to the rule of law, but they have a value beyond that. And if, if we look at, for instance, the, the, the trials of Nazi collaborators in Germany, today we are not prosecuting perpetrators of crimes against humanity and genocide committed during the Third Reich with the purpose of denazifying Germany, as it used to be the case in the 50s. We're not trying to contribute to transition to democracy in Germany. Germany is a leading rule of law champion. We're doing it for something else. We're doing it because we still need to establish truth, memory, justice as a global community, as a, as a, as a global society. Um, th the next point, perhaps, is that, and that became clear in the conversations today, criminal justice is certainly not enough. And criminal justice and a criminal trial is never a suitable environment for a collective conversation, in the words of Baba Jalo, as to the underlying causes uh, that have led to a situation of massive crimes or massive violations of human rights law. And perhaps here I can bring back to some examples from my native country, Argentina, where basically there's been a state policy of investigating and prosecuting every single human rights violation committed during the 1976-1983 dictatorship. And yet many scholars and observers have concluded that, um, that we still owe ourselves a collective discussion as to the root causes of that dictatorship, how we ended up tolerating something like that, um, and, and what does it mean in terms of our the quality of our democracy and the quality of of our approach to individual rights and political uh, confrontation and political debate. But we also have international experiences that show the limitations of a, a criminal justice response. So we have, on the one hand, what the ICTY and the ensuing national efforts to provide accountability in the Balkans uh, gave to the victims in terms of justice. But at the same time, we also know that there have not been enough to perforate the dominant narratives in the Balkans and there's still a lot of denial of the crimes, there's still a lot of refusal to accept responsibility. So you need a broader system that is not re reduced to the bipolar lo logic of criminal and innocence in a, in a criminal trial. The, my next two points is, and that was also to what uh, was said earlier in, in the discussion, the importance of also kind of like opening the horizons as to how to respond uh, to these crimes and putting the survivors at the center of the equation. And the importance of the survivor center justice is actually that has been there for a while, but it has not been implemented across the globe. And it's still today, you it's not prioritized as it should. And by this, for instance, I mean uh, hearing the views of the survivors, factor the, factoring those views into the response, and also looking beyond the criminal response to areas such as health, such as social responses. Um, in particular, in the case of uh, sexual and gender-based crime. So this is another area that is critical. And finally, uh, Gina referred to access to justice as a critical component. And here, I think that we need to start thinking out of the box a bit. And perhaps it's time to start discussing the role of custom and informal justice systems in the context of transitional justice. Not as they have been presented at times as an alternative, because that doesn't work, but as, as a complement as a mechanism that can complement uh, uh, you know, traditional forms of criminal justice response vis-a-vis -vis those crimes. And this is something that we're going to start discussing in the context of IDLO. We're starting to look at this uh, uh, in cooperation with the International Center of Traditional Justice. How do you bring justice down to the communities and make sure that there is true access to justice by everyone affected by these crimes? I am going to stop here because I think I have already exceeded my uh, allocated time. And thank you so much again for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Fabricio. And I think we will bring that to a, uh, the session to a close. Lise, would you like to make the final it's closing just, remark? It's just to thank everyone, David, to thank you, to thank Fabrizio, most of all, to thank Gina, to thank Baba, and to thank Alexandra for being with us. We appreciate your being with us today. Thank you all. Thank you.